you are coming to Christ, who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by the people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. Listen to them, 
this is how your king will treat you. Samuel explained, he will make soldiers of your sons. Some of them will serve in his war chariots, others in his cavalry, and others will run before his chariots. He will make some of them officers in charge of 50 men. Your sons will have to plow his fields, harvest his crops, and make his weapons and the equipments for his chariots. Your daughters will have to make perfumes for him and work as his swords and his bakers. He will take your best fields, vineyards, and olive groves and give them to his officials. He will take the tent of your grain and of your grace for his court officers and other officials. He will take your servants and your best cattle and donkeys and make them for him. He will take a tent of your cups and you yourselves will become slaves. When that time comes, you will complain bitterly because of your king, who you yourselves choose. But the Lord will be listened to your complaints. The people paid no attention to Samuel, but said, No, we want a king, so that we will be like other nations, with our own king to rule us and to lead us to the war and to fight our battles. And Samuel said to them, Let us all go to Gilgal and once more proclaim so as our king. So they all went to Gilgal and there at the holy place they proclaimed so our king. They offered fellowship, sacrifices, and Saul and all the people of Israel celebrated the new event. This is the word of God. Come speak to God for his words. Amen. The scripture we did is taken from Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 55. Then Jesus went home. Again, such a large crowd gathered that Jesus and his disciples had no time to eat. When his family knew about it, they set out to take charge of him. Because people were saying, he, he has one man. Some teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem were saying, he has Bezalel in him. It is the chief of the demons who gives him the power to drive them out. So Jesus called them to him and spoke to them in Hamburg. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a country divides itself into groups which fight each other, that country will fall apart. If a family divides itself into groups which fight each other, that family will fall apart. So, if Satan's kingdom divides into groups, it cannot last, but it will fall apart and come to an end. No one can break into a strong man's house and take away his belongings unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder in his house. I assure you that people can be forgiven all their sins and all the evil things they may see. But whoever sees evil things against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven because he has committed an eternal sin. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. They stood outside the house and sent a, me a message asking for him. A crowd was sitting around Jesus and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside and they want you. Jesus answered, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? He looked at the people sitting around him and said, Look, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does what all wants is my brother, my sister, my mother. This is the will of God. Thanks be to God for his faith.
We bow together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Lord, help us in our walk with you to keep our eyes on you. As yours are a watchful over us as the eyes of the sun, help us, we pray, to appreciate you as our friend, but also to adore you as our king. Help us, we pray, O Lord, to reconnect with you as our God instead of rejecting you as king. And guide us as we seek to do so through the words of your servants now and the meditations of all the hearts, O Lord, that are listening to you today. Amen. Many of us have played sports on some level growing up. When I was going to help you, I played quite a lot of sports as well. One of those sports was football. And many of our time, we as children would go on the hill to what we would call and what we call today the sweat. At the start of most of those football matches, we'd have captains that pick teams, player by player, one by one. And it was always such a hard thing to be a part of and watch with as well as it came down to the last three or four listeners. Because you knew that the feelings of those that would be picked last or being picked. And if looking at it felt that way to you, then you can only imagine the emotional turmoil happening to the last persons that were being picked. We can imagine the things going through those persons' mind. Am I not good enough? This is really embarrassing. I hope I'm not the last person to get picked. If only I were that a player, why wouldn't they like me? And at the core of those questions, friends, and negative statements, is a deeper feeling of rejection. No one really likes to be rejected. And social rejection can do a lot of harm to our psyche. In the passage from that we read today, we see God almost consoling Samuel about being rejected by the people. Because the people are very adamant that they want a king just like all the other nations had a king. Samuel was a leader, but he wasn't their king. And even more than that, the way that he was approached about giving them a king was not very kind. What did they tell him? They told him one that he was too old and two that his sons weren't really good people. They come to him essentially and they insult him and they reject his position and his lineage. He felt rejected and we only felt rejected because God has to come in and God has to console him. The Lord said to Samuel, we read, listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. And that's really important for us to know and to understand that we can try our best and we can give our all and that there will always be people that will put us down reject our ideas and our contributions. But God sees what we do, and God knows our hearts, and God does not reject us, but is always open to his children coming home. And so God knows that the people are rejecting Samuel because they've already rejected him, telling them that the king that they're asking or isn't going to be all they think he will be, doesn't help Samuel. They set their ways in what they want. They're set in what they think is best for them. Will their king deliver them from every trial and tribulation like God has so far? No. Will their king bring them prosperity as God was doing? Probably. 
they not. But they were Adamans, and so at the end of the day, they were the king. And we get King Saul. We know in hindsight that that was a mistake on their part. Saul was not just their first, but also probably their worst king. Their rejection of God meant that they weren't fruitful as a people. But as we said before, God sees what we do and God knows our hearts and regardless, God does not reject us, but is always open to his children coming home. Which takes us into our New Testament passage, with Jesus speaking to the people in parables about the vision and sin and blasphemy and forgiveness. And so we read Jesus saying, Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. I remember reading that verse as a younger person and being fearful that there was something that I could have done that would mean that I am not granted. Which would mean that essentially I am going to hell. I don't know if any of you all would have felt that as well. This verse can strike fear into the hearts of believers because many Bible verses promise forgiveness and so we get accustomed to that. But this one warns that there is a place where we dare not venture. A place that is beyond redemption. A place from which we can never return. A place where forgiveness is no longer possible. And so with this verse, we can't help but worry whether we might wake up on a judgment day to learn that we are guilty of this unforgivable sin. Well, what we may have been predisposed to think about this verse isn't entirely true, but it is partly. You see, Jesus was responding to the people calling him Beelzebub. And this was because he was doing good things. He was healing and he was teaching and he was caring for the people only to be accused of being a demon. Jesus, the Son of God, a demon. And that is what he was calling the blasphemy. And that's why Jesus made such a chilling statement. Because by saying that Jesus isn't who he says he is, means that they were stopping people from being forgiven by saying that he was something else. They rejected the one who could have brought them forgiveness and so they not only fail to see the light, but they call the light darkness. And that was what was unforgivable. Blocking people from the light that Christ represents. Rejecting the light and calling it dark. The sin is unforgivable because it is the sin of refusing forgiveness yourself. And having done that, these scribes show that they no longer recognize what is good. They no longer value it, they no longer strive for it. Having decided that Christ is satanic, they are not open to receiving his help. And are therefore not candidates for salvation that he offers. And on top of that, they were leading people astray with that way of thinking. That is what makes the sin so damn. Rejecting the Holy Spirit, rejecting forgiveness, that is what they were doing. And that's what we see people like them doing so many generations before with Samuel. Rejecting God for something that is man-made temporal, rejecting God as king for a good people, rejecting Christ as king for tradition, rejecting
rejected the Holy Spirit as king for their own agenda. We do these things too, and so we remember Christ's words to his friends, and we remember the example of what we saw turn out to be as we heed the one and as we reconnect instead of rejecting Christ as king in our lives. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our one God and true King, Jesus Christ.
Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. This before us is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust in him to share the peace that he has prepared. And so, as we acknowledge that the Lord is with us, as we lift our hearts up as a pastoral region to the Lord, we give thanks and praise to the Lord of God as we bow together in a time of prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you thanks and praise for you formed us in your image and loved us with that everlasting love that we need throughout our lives as you have graced us with gifts for sin. When we are faithless and would not follow you, forgive us and return us to you. When, you re when we rejected you, you were still faithful to us. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, your only begotten and beloved, to be for us the way, the truth, and the life. By your Holy Spirit, he anointed all who would follow him to live a new life and the love that he showed us. Therefore, O Lord, we praise you today, joining our voices with the choirs of heaven and of all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing the glory of your name. Lord of majesty, we come to you in humble obedience knowing that Jesus went to his death on the cross and raised up by your power to reign in glory and the resurrection gifts of the Holy Spirit that were poured out upon your people, that the church might embrace his ministry and live as his body in the world. Help us to do so, we pray, O Lord, remembering all your mighty and merciful acts towards us as we take this bread and this wine that is represented before us from the gifts you have given to us and celebrate with joy our redemption, won for us by Christ Jesus our Lord. Accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious and eternal God, as we continue to praise you and pray to you, we pray that you will pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ Jesus. Build up the body we pray, Christ, in your love and equip the church for the work of your ministry as we, as we do so. Hear us, O Lord, we pray, as our Savior Christ has taught us. We pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. First Corinthians 10 tells us, Because there is one loaf, we many as we are, are one body. For it is one loaf of which we all partake. And so before us, we have the body of Christ represented, the bread of life broken for us. When we break the bread, it is the sharing of the body of Christ. And when we give thanks over the cup, the cup of suffering to and the cup of salvation before us, it is the sharing of the blood of Christ. And so we have the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for that. We share in the body and blood of Christ Jesus now as the other man's are distributed.
body of Christ given for us, we eat and are thankful that are seen together.
that you have given to us to be able to show your love to the world. As we do so, Lord, we pray that you will bless us and that you will keep us, that you will make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us, that you will lift up your countenance upon us, O Lord, and grant us that grace and peace that we need in our lives this day, now, and 